and welcome to chapter three. On uh, chapter three, now we're going to talk about the PPP, the point to point protocol. Um, the PPP protocol is needed whenever you have a dedicated connection, such as T1s or um, ISDN or, um, or anything like that. So we'll talk about the serial, we'll take an overview first, and then we'll talk about how PPP operates, and then we'll take a look at how to actually configure PPP. So today we will be doing a packet tracer configuration that you need to submit in addition to some questions that I'll ask you. So please make sure you answer those questions on a separate Microsoft Word, and you also hand in the packet tracer file that we're going to go that we're going to do together okay that will be the homework for this chapter the questions in a microsoft word and the packet tracer all right so let's get going um what is serial ports serial ports are connections that sends out one bit at a time so whenever you are sending data one bit at a time out of your router or your pc that means you are sending it in a serial form um, how many bits per second is what the bandwidth means, you know, what's required. And again, mostly on your serial connections or the least like connection, that's where data, how data flows in there. And those frames that are leaving on a serial port, the most widely used is the PPP framing. Oh, sorry. Uh, one more thing. Parallel communication means you are not sending one bit at a time, but you're sending it multiple bits, like eight bits in parallel. The challenge with that, you need to have all eight bits arrive successfully. Not one of them is uh, corrupt. But if they are all good and the distance is short, you can get a much higher bandwidth with parallel communication. But with serial, because you're sending one bit at a time, the data, is, the length of the cable may be longer. That's why we use it for one connection. Now, when we when it comes to serial, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to serial communications, you may use you know the RS-232 connections on the back of your cable, or the V.35, or the S HSSI. Um, Whenever you get a frame coming in from inside the LAN, then the router pulls that packet out, puts it into another frame, a WAN frame, such as the PPP frame. And this are sending the data one bit at a time on the serial ports. Okay, so point to point links can connect two geographic area distances sites, right? but then they have to go through the service provider. Okay, so you send your data to a CSU, Challenge Servicing Unit, Data Servicing Unit device, and he'll set up the data to be sent to the, um, over that dedicated wire to the central office, your ISP, where he will take your data and go through many different routers and switches to get to your final destination. <coughs> Now, since you have a dedicated wire and no one else is going to use it, you may have at the at the at the um, at your ISP, you may have one big huge trunk that's very very fast, but they don't want to dedicate this whole wire for you. So they may give you time, you know, may allot it, you know, allow you to have a certain amount of time to use the this trunk from one switch multiplexer to another mux multiplexer. So what they do, this is called a time, a TDM. A T, TDM is a time division multiplexer, TMUX, will say, okay, your router have a certain amount of time to use to use this, to use this trunk, then this server will have another time, and this video will have another time, and a certain amount of time, let's say two seconds. Now the problem with TDMs is what happens if the server or the video doesn't want to use the trunk? They're not sending out data. That means the router has to wait till they're finished, you know, till their time is up. Let's say if it's two seconds, he has to wait four seconds and no one is using the, the trunk. So what they came up with something called statistical TDM. And what statistical TDM does is that um, 
it, uh, it, it monitors the trunk, and if no one else is using it, you can keep using it yourself. The router can use it the whole time. If somebody else kicks in, they can share the, the time between them, between each other. So it's a lot more efficient to use stat TDM than just a regular TDM. There's also TDM that multiplexes, mixes um, light signals. That's how you can get very, very high bandwidth in up to 10 gigabit. You know, synchronous optical network does that. Is it multiplexes four, for example, or 2.5 gigabit light signals together, and on the other end, be able to demultiplex them. All right, some definitions. What is a demarcation point? A demark point is the point where the responsibility of your service provider begins. This is like outside your house. If anything happens outside your house, like the wiring or the box outside, your service provider comes and takes care of it. Anything inside the house, that's your responsibility. That's the um, CPE, the customer premises equipment, right? Now, the line that connects from your house to your central, to your ISP central office is called the local loop, or they call it the last mod from the DMARC point to the central point, to the central office switch, that's the last mile or the local loop. Okay, DTE and DCE, data terminal equipment, data communication equipment. Now, what happens is when you have a router, a router is a TDE, data terminal equipment, which means it is all the data is terminated right here. Think of it that way. If it needs to be sent out, you need to give it to a DCE device. And the DCE device is the one that sets up the data to send it out. DCE devices such as the CSU, DSU, you know, channel servicing unit, data servicing unit for a router. A DCE device for a PC would be your NIC. A DCE device for a PC that wants to use ISDN is an adapter, ISDN adapter, right? Now, also, as we know, a DCE is a device that has <clears throat> can control the bandwidth that sets up the clock rate. Remember when we, when in our, in our labs, when we have two routers, right next to each other, they're going to be connected directly to each other. One of them has to have a DCE and the other one does not. The cable itself has the DCE in it, which means he's the one that dictates how fast data has to be transmitted. So you, whenever you see a DCE on one end of a router, you have to type in clock rate equal, you know, we always typically write 64,000 bits per second. Right? In our in real life, the DCE is always at the service provider, and the router at the customer is always the DTE. So it's always the um, the service provider that sets up the clock rate, and you as a DTE just say I accept. All right, here's the typical serial cables that are out there. Here's the back of your router. So this is like the ones that we have in the lab. Serial one on the top, serial two. Usually that adapter comes in two serial with two serial ports, and you can put it into one of those four slots if you have that 2800 router. And remember, the one on the bottom right hand is always the serial. That's where we get our serial triple zero. Serial bandwidths. Bandwidth. Excuse me. Here's a list of all the data rates that can be transferred over a serial link. <coughs> Any communication, not a serial link, I'm sorry. So you can have a dial-up all the way to a gigabit over a fiber optic, 40 gigs. So depending on really how much money you have, you can go from 56 kilobits per second to 40 gigabit per second. My connections, we discussed from last chapter, are three ways. You can go with leased lines, dedicated lines. If you want a dedicated line, you're going to use PPP. If 
you want to go circuit switching, that means you dial in and recruit. in other words, you are trying, you are requesting a dedicated line for a certain amount of time. And again, you're still going to use PPP. You can, by the way, by default, HDLC is the one that's set up for um, Cisco routers. So here's question number one. What is the default framing between two Cisco routers? And the answer is HDLC. That's question number one. Now, we don't want that default because it doesn't provide a lot of options, authentications, and things like that. It's a genetic framing. We want to use PPP. And we'll discuss that later. And why PPP is the preferred framing on a on a leased line or on a circuit switching line. Well, now, when it comes to packet switching, you know, the preferred is frame relay because it's the least expensive. ATM is, is okay too if you want higher speed and if you are within a certain limit, really. But frame relay is most widely deployed and it's less expensive. <clears throat> okay, HDLC framing was designed by IBM many years ago. It says here, uh, I know it was designed in the, the international organization um, took it over and uh, since then each because it was an open source anybody can use it so Cisco took the HDLC framing and improvised a little bit. So an HDLC, a Cisco HDLC frame is not compatible with a Juniper HDLC frame. So if you connect a Cisco router with a Juniper router and you leave the framing, the default framings, they're not going to communicate with each other because Cisco HDLC has been changed and probably Juniper uh, HDLC, they changed it too. Um, that's why everybody wants to use uh, PPP. All right, so when it comes to the HDLC frame, you have the data that goes right in here. And it, you know, how big is the data? It all depends. You know, it varies, really, to be honest with you. You put the, fra the flags at, the, uh, <clears throat> at both ends of the frame. The flags are to indicate the beginning and the ending of the frame. The address is really nothing in there because uh, you're directly connected so there is really no address it's all ones the FCS the frame check sequence is to check the integrity of the frame this is similar to the FCS in an Ethernet frame when you are sending an Ethernet frame the control is where all the goodies are that tells you you know what type of data you have and things like that how do you change the framing to HDLC if it was something else? It was frame. If, let's say if the framing was on an on a serial port was a frame relay or PPP, and you want to change it back to HDLC, you just go to the interface and then type encapsulation HDLC. All right. So whenever you want troubleshooting a serial interface, let's say a serial interface is not up, it's not thinking green. And you type show interface serial triple zero. If you see up and up, it means it's good. And if you see um, that the framing is HDLC, if you and if you see this, this is saying also on this on show controller serial triple zero shows you that the DCE, which means the cable, is being used as V.35, not the RS232. Okay, now if you see up and up, that means everything's connecting beautifully and everything works um, nicely. There's connection, the configuration is nice. If the serial sees is down and therefore you got several issues, that might be the problem. The router is not sensing a carrier, so that means the, connect, the other router on the other end that's directly connected to it, it's not sending him anything. That means it may be down shut off, doesn't even exist. The service provider didn't um, has some sort of connection or down. The cable is no good that's connecting to the serial port or some hardware failure. So when you see down on the first 
part, I'm talking about this now. That means you got major issues. It's either the cable or your piece of hardware is no good, or the other router on the other or is down. Somebody shut it down. It's not even connecting. Okay? Now, typically this is up. And if this is down, then you got other problems. And maybe you don't you have the wrong clock rate, and these are different types of clock rates that can be that can solve this problem. Um, you can have the CSU, the remote CSU DSU device tight. It's no longer sending them keep live bits. Um, <clears throat> the DTE device doesn't support or is not set for SCTE timing mode, which is really not familiar with. There's a looping that occurred that might have happened. So if there's a loopback interface configuration, so I have no loopback, that might help. Um, you may be configuration problem too, like the wrong, you know, the two serial and remember they have to be in the same subnet. You may have them in, you know, you may type in the subnet mask or um, or the IP address wrong that puts you in a different subnet. Or maybe if it says administratively shut down, you know what to do. You just type no shut, right? And that's if you see it red. All right, let's go into the PPP operation and see how that works. So the point-to-point -point protocol, what they did is they took the point-to-point -to -point protocol, they took the HDLC frame, and they added two features to it, which are, which are big features. Features. They added the link control protocol, and they added the NCP, the network control protocol. The LCP is like a manager that manages the links between both routers. He is the one that sets up the connections, releases the connections. If you have to have any authentication, like a password, he's the one that encrypts it, sends it over, and he takes his password, sends it over to you, and things like that. So he's the manager of the link and keeps an eye on the link and makes sure everything's good. That's what the LCP is good. HDLC did not have that. NCP allows you to encapsulate or carry packets other than IP. So you may have IPX packet in the frame, in the PPP frame. Apple Talk packets in the PPP frame. That's when the NCP does. All right? So it's versatile. <clears throat> The advantages is not proprietary. It's open port. Anybody can use it since everybody uses it. So you can connect, you know, Cisco router with a non-Cisco router. And again, it allows you to have those options in between. Here is your NCP. You know, it does IPv4 and IPv6. It works. Um, it can give you authentication too. And synchronous or synchronous, it could be either uh, on a synchronous media or lease lines with why, with the clock rates, and you don't even have to have uh, lease lines for dial-ups. You don't have to have directly connected, so it could be with dial-up or, or just directly connected without having to dial in. Okay, the link control protocol also allows you to handle um, LCP. Like I told you, like the manager that manages the link, keeps an eye on the link, and make sure that you always have connections. So it detects common misconfiguration errors, terminates the link when it needs to, and things like that. And the NCP, the network control protocol, is what allows multiple layer three packets to be encapsulated in the uh, PPP frame. Here's a typical PPP frame where the data is right here. The flags indicate the beginning and the ending of the frame. The address is really not important because you're gonna be directly connected. And again, the FCS is to check the integrity of the frame, make sure everything arrives successfully. And the protocol is to tell you what type of data that's in there. The control is really control packets to control the, the data as it's flowing. All right, PPP, 
there are three phases that you have to go through before you are connected, before you have PPP connections. The first thing that comes up, if you are PPP, if you are told to encapsulate your packets in PPP frame, and this guy was told the same thing, then the first thing they do is they go through phase one. They say, hey, I'm running PPP and I'm running PPP. Let's create a connection with each other. Let's negotiate. All right, so say, all right, we want to be PPP connected. That's phase one. They agree that they're both PPP. Now, remember, if this guy is PPP and he is still HDLC, they, the phase one fails because they're not both BPPs and no connection. So when we do our configuration, you will see that as soon as we go on one end and we set up PPP, we're going to lose connection until we get to the other end and set it up, and it comes, then the connection comes back up. In phase two, then they go through the, all the different options. If Let's say you have um, quality assurance. For example, you can set up the quality to be 80%. Make sure that 80% of the data that goes through, went through, and nothing failed. The link doesn't keep going up and down. A reliable link should receive 80% of the data, for example. You can set it up to 90%. Or, for example, let's say um, in phase two, let's say we set up passwords. You say, all right, you give me your password, I'll give you mine, and you do authentication. If the authentication failed, then phase two fails, and therefore you lose your connection. No PPP link connections. So all the other options happens in phase two. If any of the options fail, we don't go to phase three. You will lose the connection. Phase three is when we decide and what type of protocol we're going to do. And most likely we are going to um, use PPP. I'm sorry. IP protocol, IP packet that we're going to set up. <clears throat> so there are three phases when you are establishing PPPs. Phase one, two, and three. And, yeah, you know what? No, no, it's okay. I was going to say to answer those questions. So do me a favor in question, I think number two, now that I'm asking you, I want you to list the three phases that are needed to establish a PPP session. Phase one, just write the first sentence, phase two, and phase three. Okay, so when it comes to LCP operation, this is the link control protocol. Think of it as the manager that manages the two links together, keeps an eye on the link, right? So we don't have to get into a lot of the details of it, but he can send back in data to make sure he runs around between both routers and make sure it keeps an eye on the link, make sure everybody is where they're supposed to be. All right. The LCP packet itself may be sending, you know, PPP frames. This is after the link comes up, of course. And here are the different LCP packets that you can have. We really never get into any of that, to the details, unless you are really troubleshooting it to find out exactly what's causing major issues. But you never need to go that far, even in real life. All right, this is in phase two. This is where the options are. You have an option to set up sort of an authentication. You have either password authentication protocol, PAP, or challenge handshaking authentication protocol, CHAP. So you can choose one of these two authentication methods. Uh, CHAP is much better than PAP. We'll discuss that. You can have a compression between, so you can um, conserve bandwidth, but you have to decide on what type of compression you want. How do you compress your data? You can either use the stacker or the predictor. You can use multi-link for um, load balancing, and so on. So that happens really at uh, second phase. Now, NCP operation, this is just to make sure that you are using IP4 or IPv6 packets. Everybody explain, you know, everybody, both routers agree with the protocol, which packet is going to be 
shared. All right, now we get into the configuration. So <clears throat> there's, you can, again, really in the configuration, you just say encapsulation PPP. If you don't have any options, then you just let it go. And that's it. But the main reason you want to use PPP and not leave it with the default HDLC is because you have all of these options, especially the authentication, right? So you want to be able to use any of that. All right, and so here you type in IPP encapsulation PPP, and then you'll, uh, that's all you have to do. And it leaves whatever, if, if it was HDLC, then it becomes PPP. And here you can set up and you say, I want the compress, the compression file to be predicator, and you got to do it the same to both sides. You may use stack instead. You may use quality of 80, PPP quality, which means if, 80% of the data has to be successful. If it's not, break up the link and start a new, establish a new link, right? Because sometimes that happens. <laughs> um, and so on. you may use multi-link, a bundling, um, just like Ethernet for um, load balancing. This is how you set it up. And here's some verifying to make sure that PPP configuration is done successfully. You type show IP interfaces serial. Make sure both of them are up. Make sure that the encapsulation PPP is there and that the LCP is open. The link control protocol, the manager has opened the link. If you see that closed, that means the three phases to establish a link has failed. Okay? So you may have PPP on both sides, but if you come in here and you type show interfaces serial triple zero and you see LCP is closed, you know, you may suspect one of the options failed. Maybe somebody did not authenticate correctly or have the wrong IP address. <clears throat> All right, so you can verify the multi-link, show PPP multi-link, and you can set up the passwords. Now, when it comes, there are two different types of passwords, and then we'll get into our packet tracer in a minute. Um, <clears throat> the two, there, there's the PAP, the password authentication protocol, which all it does is I give you my password, my name and password. You look it up in your database, and if it's all good, then you give me your username and password, and I'll authenticate you, and I'll accept you. And that's it. Then we have a link. This mutual authentication, by the way. You give me yours, I give you mine. And this guy does the same thing. I give you you Now, with CHAP, it's a little bit different. I give you my username but I encrypt, I hash using MD5, my password. It's encrypted. I give it to you. You authenticate. And then you keep challenging me. Hey, give me your password again. Give me your password again. This is to make sure that um, I don't always, you know, if somebody, I want to make sure it's still you. Because somebody, the problem here in PAP, once I accepted you, the link opens up. Now, if this guy goes away and somebody else can come in and the link is still open, no good. When this guy is constantly challenging you, if somebody else comes in, he's not going to have that password, and then the link will break. The LCP guy is the one that breaks the link if they're the authentication field. So CHAP is a, a three-way handshaking. I give you your password, you give me mine, that's two, and then the challenging happens. Everybody challenges the other three ways. This guy is two ways. I give you your password, and I, give, and I either, you know, reject, and, I, and you give me mine, and that's it. And we both either, we, you know, accept or reject, and it's all over. All right, so um, let's go and do some packet tracer, and then we'll take a look at it while we're doing it. And then we'll talk at the, can, how to, can, um, how to uh, troubleshoot it. So it's easy to use. So, in fact, let me just go. I think troubleshooting is really very easy. Let me just finish out the chapter. So this way, when we're done with the packet tracer, we can just close out the chapter. When it comes to um, trouble, you know what? Let's leave this because we'll, we'll discuss it after we're all done with the packet tracer. All right. So go and load, open up a clean packet tracer. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do PAP and CHAP authentication. So what I want you to do is I want you to bring one, two, three routers. 
Okay. I want you to call this on the left hand side R1. Call this R2. And I want you to call this R3. Okay. And um, let's do three PCs. Call this PC1, PC2, PC3. Connections and use a crossover co over to go into R1. Fast Ethernet to R2, PC3 to R3. Okay. Now we need links, serial links. Actually, you have to go to the physical, turn it off. Let's put a WIC 2T right here, turn it back on, and do the same thing for R2 and R3. Let's grab a WIC 2T, pop it in there, and let's go in here, turn off the router, and then turn it back on. Let me just make sure I turned it back on. Yes, I did. All right, now <clears throat> let's make R2 is the DCE. So I'll grab a DCE cable. This is the DCE from serial triple zero to serial triple zero to serial triple zero and go from another DCE go from serial 001 and you know what let's go to 001 so this way we're always consistent so this guy is serial 001 both 001 the, the triple zero here all right now we have one two three networks so let's um so we don't have to do any Subnetting. Let's make this 192.168.10.0 slash 24 network. Um, this one is going to be 192.168.11.0 slash 24 network. And this one is going to be 192.168.12.0 slash 24 network. It's a one Okay, let's make the links um, 172.16.100.4 slash 30. And this link will make it 172.16.100.8 slash 30. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm really losing my voice. All right, now let's give the PC the first address. Actually, the first address and the second address goes to the link. So go to PC1 and put in 192.168.10.1 and spam 122.168.10.2. That's going to be the this address right here, right? Let's go to PC2, set that up, and that's going to be 192.168.11.1, okay, let's go to PC3, and in PC3 we have 192.168.12.1, 192.168.12.1, Two. All right, good. Now we're going to get into the routers. I just want to make this look a little bit neater. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's go to router one and just do the be the basic uh, the basic setup. Go to CLI. If you see this, say no. Type en config t no ip domain hookup like we always do. Set up the host name R1. What am I doing? 
All right, I'm trying to speed things up a little bit. No IP domain lookup. Do the host name R1. Let's go to the interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. Give it the IP at 192.168.10.2. Subnet mask slash 24. And no shot. Let's go to the serial triple zero. And say IP at 172.16.100.5. That's slash 30. It doesn't need a clock rate. Just a no shot will do it. Okay. All right, let's go to router 2, CLI, say no, type EN, config T, no IP domain, domain, look up, okay, host, name or two. Let's go to the interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 and say IP at 192.168.11.2.55.0. No shop. Let's go to the serial triple zero right here. Interface serial triple zero. And say IP at 172.16.100.6, 355s and uh, 252. Now, oops, what did I do? Too many fives. Here we go. Um, it needs a clock rate because that's the DCE. Let's put the 6400 and no shot. Now let's go to the serial 001 and that gets the 172.16.100.9, right? Because the 8 is the network. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So I go to the serial 001 and I say IP add 172.16.100.9. 255, 255, 255, 252. It needs a clock rate of 6,400. And a no shot. Because remember I said both of these are going to be the DCEs. Right? So now we go to R3. Pretty much done here. Let's go to R3. And say no. EN config T, no IP domain lookup, and host name of R3. Let's go to the interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. Right? And say IP add. 192.168.12.2.255.255.255.0. No shot. And let me go. Wait a second. It was changed up and it still does not show green. That means this is made probably. Okay, it was connected to fast Ethernet 01. Hmm. All right, let's get back in there and let's go to the serial 001. Interface serial 001. Oops. All right, let's have the IP at 172.16.100.12.10. 255.255.255.0.252. All right, we got to slow down a little bit. 
172.6100. There is no dot 12. I don't know where that's coming from. And just a no shutter will do it. Okay. So now you should have everybody green. Now we need a <laughs> we need a routing protocol between them so everybody can ping. Let's use OSPF. So I'll go to router one and I'll say exit. Let's say router OSPF. Let's use the process ID one. And we're gonna say network 192.168.10.2. It's this guy, right? So I can use the wildcard of four zeros and say area zero, right? And then I'm going to say work. This one, 172.16.100.5. I'm using this address right here. And the quad zeros, area zero. Okay, just don't forget the passive interface on the fast Ethernet zero zero. Remember the quad zeros will figure out what the wildcard is, so you don't have to figure it out yourself. Let me just passive interface the passive interface. Okay, now I go to router two. Pretty much do the same thing. <coughs> Excuse me, router. OSPF1 and uh, the network. Let's do the serial network first. 172.16.100.6 quad zeros. Area zero. And then network. Ah, uh, she's <coughs> I want network. That's the next one. I want network 192.168.11.2. That's this guy right here, right? With quad zeros. And then this link should be transmitted too, right? Um, network 172. Dot sixteen dot one hundred dot ten. Right? And then you want to do the passive interface on the fast in a zero slash zero. Okay. Now we do out of three. I'll do it slow. Slowly. Go ahead. Exit. You say router OSPF one on the process ID. Then you go in to advertise this LAN, 192.168.12.2, this interface right here, quad zero, so we can force the wild card. And then you don't forget we always have to write area zero at the end. And now we need to advertise the link. So you're going to say network. 172.16.100.8, not dot eight, dot ten, with quad zeros, space, area, zero. And now you're going to do the passive interface on the fast Ethernet zero slash zero. Okay? And I should do it. Now I do control Z. Let's troubleshoot if there's any problems. You have to type show IP route. And I see OSPF is not running. It's not running between these two routers. Let's go here first. Let's see if there's OSPF running. I do show IP route. And I see 192.168.10. So his guy talked to him. And he sent him his routing table. Let's see R1. If he's good. Looks like it's good because I can see this right here. I do show IP route. And I see the 11.0. Good. 
about router one, router two, and router three OSBF is. Oh, good. <coughs> so I'll go to router two first, and I'll do show run. Let's see if he's advertising correctly. First of all, I want to see the serial port, make sure it's configured and it's up. So I go to the serial 001. And it's 172.16.100.9 with 3.255.0, and it has the clock rate. So that's good. Then I go down to OSP up and make sure that he he's advertising the 110, 192.168.11.2. .2, good. That's this. With area 0, good. And 172.16.100. Oh, no, not dot 10. It's supposed to be dot 9. Your dot nine. He doesn't have dot ten. Hmm, so we gotta take that out. It's best to take it out. And then put in dot nine instead. So that's the problem. So you go to config T and you say router OSPF one. <clears throat> Listen, if you did it right, just watch. And you say no. And what I do is I highlight this. Let me highlight it again. Right click, copy, and it's out. And now I'll bring it back, take out the word no, and change the 10 to a 9. Now we'll wait a few seconds to see if that solved the problem because they should send OSPF updates to each other, and bingo, it did. So I do Control Z, I do Show I. P route. Now I see the O comes from 10 and he sees the C connection. Okay, good. But it's still, I don't see. There it is. There's the 12 network. Let's go to R3 and make sure he has it. So that was the problem. Show IP route. And there it is. The, he sees the 11 and the 12, right? The, I'm sorry, the links, 10 and the 11. So he sees everybody for me. So this guy can actually ping this guy now if you wanted to. All right, so <clears throat> here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do, um, excuse me for a second. I'm going to do PPP with, here. you know what? I'll write it up. I'm going to do PPP with authentication PAP on this link, and I'm going to do PPP with authentication CHAP on this end. I'll show you how easy it is. So here's what, here's what we're going to do. First of all, go to router 1, and I want you to type show interface serial triple zero. And uh, you see that the it's both are up, so that's good. We should have typed show IP interface serial triple zero. That's what I needed because I wanted to show you something. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, the enable is in there, and um, show IP interface. Don't tell me you have to type the whole word. Show IP interface heal zero slash zero slash zero. Same thing. Oh, God. Are we on the, yeah, the triple zero right here? So it has the IP address. Okay. Show IP, Show IP interfaces. Okay, show interface serial triple zero is uh, tells us that the encapsulation is HDLC. That's what I'm looking for. Show interface serial. So this is HDLC, the default. 
we're going to change it to PPP. But before we do that, because we're going to do authentication with each other, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to use his name, the username, and password. Put it in the database. So go to config T and say, in my database, remember I'm on R1, I'm going to put the username R2, remember his host name is your, his username, R2, and the password is going to be Cisco. Okay? Remember that. We have to go to R2 now. I'm just going to do it at the same time so it makes it easier so you'll understand. Go to config T on R2 and you're going to say, hey, listen, I'm going to put in my database the username R1, this guy's name, his name, and the password is going to be also Cisco. It has to be the same password. Right? So when he sends me his username and password, I have it in my database and I can authenticate him. Okay, let's go back to R1. Now I go to the interface right here. Serial triple zero. And I say encapsulation, hit the tab key. I want it to be PPP. So now the link went down. Right? Because now the encapsulate you're telling the serial port right here, whenever you receive any packet that's going to leave this serial port, it has to be encapsulated in a PPP frame. But the problem is on this guy, he encapsulates his frame as an HDLC still. That's why the link broke, because they're not phase one of PPP failed, right? In fact, before we move on, you don't have to do this if you want. If you don't want to, you type show interface serial triple zero. And you see that encapsulation is PPP, but the LCP is closed because phase one failed, right? But when we go set this up, it's going to open up. The link control protocol, the manager will open it up. All right. Now that this is PPP, let me go back, config T, and let me go to the interface serial triple zero. It's already. Now I'm going to say PPP. I want. Oops, don't hit the enter key. PPP, write A-U-T-A. I want the authentication to be PAP. Okay? But then if you knew, if you use PAP, then you have to write another command saying, PPP PAP, please send, send username, my username, which is R1, with the password Cisco. Okay, remember, you have to write that line when you're doing PAP. Okay, let's go to R2 now and set it up. So if you go to R2, <coughs> excuse me, he's going, let's, so let's, uh, the first thing is we go to the interface, interface serial triple zero, and we say encapsulation PPP. See, the link didn't come up yet, yet, still. Why? Because it has a password. PAP. Set up on it. Then you're going to go say, PPP, I want the authentication to be PAP. Okay? And, I, and then say, PPP, PAP. Please send my username, R2, with a password, Cisco. Now they should be able to, everything should come up. Now you see, now it came up because they passed the password and now the links open up. And now if you go control Z and type show interface serial triple zero, you see that the LCP opened up. And now you can ping and now you have a secured um, PPP link. Isn't that nice? Now, it's not, I mean, it's not as secure as CHAP. We're going to do CHAP now here. So let's do CHAP between these two guys. So the first thing this guy is going to do is going to put the username R3 with a password inside his database. So let's go to config T. And he's going to say username R3, the password, let's call it Cisco1. Use a different password. 
And might as well, since we're here, let's go to the interface serial 001, which is this one right here, and say I want the encapsulation to be BPP. See, the link goes down. And then you say PPP authentication chap. That's it. You don't even have to type send my username to this guy because this guy is going to challenge him and ask for it anyway. So you don't have to type that command. That's it. You type in encapsulation PPP and PPP encapsulation chap. Finito. Let's go to R3. Oops. Let's go to R3. And in R3, you do config T. And you go to the inter. Oh, we got to set up the username. You got to have it in your database. What is it? R2 is going to have the password Cisco1 sending me. Right? And then you go to the interface serial 001 right here. And then you say, I want the encapsulation to be PPP. And then the PPP, see, it comes up because he authenticated already. He already challenged him. And PPP, make sure you set it up on this side. PPP, um, oh, come on, give me a break. PPP, authentication, chap. It's best to do it on both sides. And you're all good. Now the links are back up. If you type control, oops, hit the wrong button, control Z, and you type show interface serial triple zero, and you see that the LCP, that's triple zero, double one I want. You know that the LCP opened it up and you're all good to go. All right, open up for IP packets. That's what's been encapsulated inside. All right, that's it. So now you know how to set up PPP with authentication. So now there's a more secured PPP between these two links. And this is, we set up PAP and CHAP on that. And by the way, after you type, for example, um, the command, you know, up here, and you typed after you do the encapsulation, you can do any of the options, the compress, the link control, all of that right here, right underneath. Very easy configuration. All right, let's go back to our notes and finalize the chapter. Now, if there's any problems, you can actually type debug packet, debug negotiation, debug error, debug authentication. The debug command, what it does is it tells the um, the router to go out and execute. For example, if you type if you type debug authenticate debug PPP authentication, it goes out and it will ask for a password for mutual authentication. Ask a password from the router that's directly connected, and the other router will pass his password and username, and there's an authentication, and it will tell you in real time what happened if it was okay or not. Okay, debug command is in real time and it's constantly updating you with information. The show command is similar to debug, but it just takes a snapshot. The problem with debug, if you leave it on, it's just constantly generating data. So it may slow down the actual performance of your network. So you have to make sure that when you're finished with debugging, just type on debug, on debug space all. ALL, which means it turns off all the debugging commands because they're generating, you know, live data constantly. All right, so he's a debug or PPP authentication. No password was defined. You get that immediately telling you. So you know that there's password problems between both routers. Okay, and that finishes chapter three. So make sure you send in the questions and the packet tracer for homework. All right, guys? Hopefully, we'll do more hands-on in class, of course. We'll have a lot of fun on this. So um, until Chapter 4, God bless.